Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack a Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito This is the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Sharon and Eric Lopez. Welcome to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Happy Holidays, Night Nation. Jeff Sharon and Eric Lopez with you here as we wind down the fall. We wind up the spring. We, it's, we're right around New Year's Day. We've got, we can wrap up the football season. Basketball is getting ready to pop on with Michigan coming in this Thursday. It's going to be a big game for that. We're going to talk about that with Taylor Young. Put a wrap on the football season after that tremendous win over the Florida Gators last week, and uh, lots of other things. We're gonna take. We got your questions uh, from Twitter that we're gonna answer here, and some volleyball transfer news as well. So that should be fun to talk about. Eric, how are you? How was the holiday? I'm sure that Christmas Day was a beautiful one after that victory on the 23rd, wasn't it? It was. It was a nice one, and uh, you know, so it's so nice to reflect on it and. Still people talking about it, and many people tuned into it, so that's good. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a second, too. Also, Stat Boy Drew himself, Andrew Glukov, joins us here on the Black and Gold Banner Podcast, since he was, you know, at the game and stuff. And uh, and we'll talk about And so we're talking with you. I mean, first of all, and, and Drew, I want to start with you as we talk about the, uh, as we just put a wrap on this, the atmosphere of that game. I, it was hard for us to, you know, you were there. We saw it on, all saw it on TV, but I wanted you to kind of, set the scene for us what was it really like in terms of the uh fan breakdown and the and, and the atmosphere of that game well m- much like you know UCF games at the bounce house you know you have to wait till the first quarter ends to really know how full the stadium is going to be because I there was a lot of people there was a lot of traffic issues getting there there were people who are showing up late because they just couldn't get in so you had to wait a, a little lot of bit people but, getting in from Orlando too to yeah to Tampa. I mean Polk, Polk County rearing its ugly head once again traffic in well, Tampa I mean, the I'm joke's shocked. always been it takes an hour in Orlando to get to Orlando and sometimes it actually applies to Tampa I'm I, I took uh, my wife and daughter to the uh, Tampa Lowry Park Zoo and to get from the interchange of the Selman over onto uh, I-4 and then 275, because there was a Bucks game that day, it took over 30 minutes to drive a mile. I mean, it, um, and that was it's probably longer than that. I yeah. mean, it's, that area is just is brutal. And, you know, anyone who's driving I-4 to get into town, and switch over to 275 to get towards the stadium, it gets backed up. So there were a lot of fans that came in late. So, if, you know, end of the first quarter gives you a good idea. Was it a packed house? No. Do I think the the ticket numbers were inflated? Yes, they always are. Uh, that was tickets distributed. I think 57, 58,000 is a very realistic number, That's which for good. that bowl is still absolutely fantastic. Doubles the record uh, because the, the record – actual was about 28,000 from 2019. So, I mean, the, the atmosphere was great. Uh, it was close to 50, 50. The problem with trying to figure out who actually had more is there was fans scattered everywhere. Yeah. I uh, noticed that too. Yeah. It wasn't just UCF side, Florida side. I mean, heck I, I had friends, uh, you know, one was rooting for UCF, one was rooting for Florida and they're sitting together on the UCF side. Uh, so it was really hard just because there were so many friends that kind of mixed the, you know, fan loyalties. Uh, but I, I tell you what, just because of the, nat- the nature of the color, it was easier to spot Florida fans just because the, the orange pops, it sticks out, especially in the evening, the, the black of UC have kind of blended in a little bit more. Uh, what you didn't see many of was red seats, which of course is a staple of South Florida games. <laughs> 
Uh, let's. I, I want to ask this to the two of you here, and Eric, I'm going to switch over to you. Now that this thing is in the books, nine and four season, first ever win over Florida. In the big picture, now that we've digested it, what does it mean for UCF's program? What did this game really mean, Eric? Well, I think it's the official kickstart of the Gus Malzahn era. This is going to be, he's the first ever UCF head coach to win the bowl, uh, his first bowl game as UCF head coach. George O'Leary lost uh, his first bowl game in Hawaii. Scott, Scott Frost, Frost lost his first, his first bowl game. game. Josh yeah. Heupel lost his first bowl game. To beat Florida first time ever, I think that's significant. I think there's this, this four things. This cements Gus Malzahn, I think, is maybe one of the three best head coaching jobs in the history of UCF football. I would put this up there with the 2017 Scott wow, Frost season. Wow, after one year. Best season job, best job. Best job okay. any coach has done. Okay. This goes right there with the 2017 Scott Frost year and the 2005 George O'Leary year. I think those are your, to me, this year's Gus Malzahn's head coaching job, the 05 O'Leary job. Remember, UCF was winless going into the season, no expectations, mm -hmm. get to the first bowl game. And then Scott Frost's 17 year going from six and seven undefeated. To me, those are the three best head coaching jobs in a single season in UCF football history, at least in the Division One era. I will apologize to the late great Gene McDowell. Can't not going to speculate on which is which year was his best job. Maybe ninety. Uh, so I think that's significant. I think this was a top ten win program history. Some would say maybe even borderline top five, depending on your perspective, because of who you beat. Because again, and we've talked about this leading up to the game. You're talking about everybody that's a UCF fan probably has a friend, relative, et cetera, that's a Gator or has ties to Florida. So there's that interaction right off the bat. And that was a huge accomplishment. And I think this game uh, will be remembered for that reason and also will be remembered as the tribute to Otis Sanderson and the Ryan O'Keefe performance. I think Ryan O'Keefe is a top three, top four performance, bowl game history for UCF. And I think the fact the tribute to Otis Anderson, to me, that touchdown that he caught with the peace sign, we might as well just give him the bannies now for play of the year because there's not going to be a play that's going to I would say moment of the year. Fair. Moment of the year. Give him an award. It's done. Drew, what do you think? Uh, well, I, I mean, I put it in the top 10. I was talking a friend of mine who's he, – he didn't go to Florida, but he's been a lifetime Gator fan. He's season ticket holder. He and I were talking before the Florida another, State Another game. one of those, huh? Well, no, this was before the Florida <laughs> State game. Uh, and he goes, you know, I'll be honest. If Florida wins and they get a bowl offer, they should turn it down. He goes, they don't deserve a bowl game. And, and this is before the Florida State game ever happened. So, I, I, obviously, the, the idea how of How elitist do you that, have to be? How elitist do you have to be to be like, oh, if we get a bowl invitation, we just turn it down? Well, I kind of give him this look like, it, like <laughs> really? 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 You know, it's – as I told him, it's more the it's just as much about the game as it's about the experience the players get. You know, the the game itself is a glorified exhibition game. The experience that the players get, the coaches get, you know, throughout the 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 bowl week, that's where actually bowls really excel. That's where it really makes a difference. Otherwise, it's just another game. It's not meant to be another game. So you know, from 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 that aspect, okay, I, I can see where he's a little upset. Oh, they're you know they're five and six at this point. They've looked terrible. Everything's you know, the wheels have fallen off. Um, Dan Mullen's gone. I mean everything that can go wrong. But you know, in the end, it's not about what the fans want. It's about the it's about the players. And this is about the players. Uh, Greg Knox, the interim coach in the post game interview, was was his voice was cracking. He was very he was barely able to keep it together. Uh, this meant a lot going out and trying to win meant a lot to him and it meant a lot to the players. Um, you know, Emory Jones uh, was there at the post game. He was very quiet. You can tell they were very sullen. And, you know, I, I, I think that matters. I think, I, I think the talking heads and fans in denial with the, with that sense of elitism kind of lose sight of the fact that it's not about them. It's about the guys on the field. And none of them want to lose a game. If, if you don't care if you win or lose a game, you have no business being on the field. Could you imagine the reaction if one if a Florida player after the game came out and said, eh, 
that game really didn't matter. Could you oh. imagine how 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 well, but they did that he last, would have been the, roasted if they if one well of them Dan said that? Mullen Dan Mullen did that last year after the Cotton Bowl against Oklahoma basically said ah this is just a scrimmage we didn't okay but I'm team. talking about a player. Well, I think some players don't usually say that publicly. They won't say it publicly. Some because they're not you know, stupid. Try... They, I mean, that, right? You wouldn't say it. right. Yeah, right. You don't. Well, you don't invite that kind of uh, communication. Look, obviously, I would say, look, in Florida's fans' defense, this was not their expectations this season. Their expectations was to shoot yeah. higher. So it'd be no different. Uh, they were two points away from from Alabama. You know, right, or, right. They were optimistic. They felt they could compete in the SEC, and they fell flat. And now they have a new head coach again. So. I get. I actually respect the fact they didn't. That the fan didn't want to play in the bowl game because he didn't think they deserve it. I mean, there are people that believe that a six and six team shouldn't play in a bowl game. Uh, His name's that, Eric Lopez. Well, me and many others <laughs> that does not believe there should be a lot of bowl games. In period, and that's been one of the. At least this year, we're not going to get a lot of bowl games because there's many cancellation, which is a big positive this year of playing a pre-Christmas bowl game because there's no guarantees you would have been able to play post-Christmas, and I think that's a. The positive to your point, you got a game in, you got some extra reps is your point. Well, and what I was telling him after, because he uh, he originally called me, he's like, hey, you want to go to the game? And then when I told him that I was working the game, he ended up not going. Uh, but he and I were talking actually wow, big yesterday. Time no, Drew, you're, you're, <laughs> wait, I can't. Oh, you're big time with me. You can't hang out with me? I'm not going. That was pretty much it. <laughs> That's yeah. kind of what he said to me. He's like, I go, you big time. Uh, but... Long story short, he and I were talking about it last night, and he goes, you know, you know, Florida was a pretty bad team. I said, it's a pre-Christmas bowl game. You're not going to get good teams. I mean, let's be honest. Neither of these teams were good by any stretch of the imagination. They were all right. Uh, this was not a good UCF team. You know, the, yeah, they, they ended up with nine wins, but, I mean, they struggled at times. They, they couldn't find consistency. Uh, the injuries that dealt with overall, the whole I, I body think, I work. think it would be fair to say that UCF maximized what they could. This yes, year. they maximized what they could. But this was not a, a you know, from, from a top 25 standpoint, a good team. Uh, they got lucky at times and, and eventually figured themselves out. Like the defense got better as the year wore on. The offense, not so much. Uh, that one was incredibly inconsistent. But that's part of the growing pains. Now, I do want to point out that that people have noticed the job that Gus Malzahn has done has been named a finalist for the Steve Spurrier First Year Coach Award uh, today. Uh, one of the guys he's going up against is none other than UCF's former coach, Josh Heupel, who won the award with UCF in 2018 as best first, co- first year coach in the country. So it's between those two and Shane Beamer uh, from South Carolina. That'll be announced next month. But I mean, people have noticed the job that that Gus Melzon has done. You know, you've lost what twenty seven players off the roster to injuries. You you had to you know coach and transfers a, too and transfers. You basically had to you, you had to coach from from a table because your leg got broken in an accident. <laughs> Every, <laughs> an everybody got accident. everybody got hurt. It was dealing with injuries this year. You know, you, you, the players, the coaches, the PA announcer, everybody. I mean, no one's safe. <laughs> hey, hey at, at least, you know, at least us in the, in the, uh, the press box, we were safe, but I guess you were too close to the program. Nope. You, you were, <laughs> uh, you were lined up for injury too. I, guess. But, <laughs> I mean, but, but let, let's take this for what, let's look at it from outside the, the, the standpoint of, you know, it not being a good team. Uh, the mental aspect, uh, this was a scrappy team, never quit, yeah. never gave in, even when uh, going up against teams better than like a Cincinnati or an SMU, they never gave up. And, you know, you saw that in the second half against Cincinnati after getting blown up 35, uh, nothing, they tightened up. Uh, even though yeah. Cincinnati kind of took the foot off the gas a little bit, which they have a habit of doing the, they, the team, kept going and and they kind of start figuring it out a little bit Uh, that's good for the future and and you need that you need that continuity obviously UCF losing G uh Jay Kinney uh head new gonna be the new head coach of Incarnate Word FCS program you know congratulations UCF reloading really quickly bringing in Chip Lindsay and a an odd story in itself thinking everyone thought he was being hired at Florida Atlantic to be the the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach there uh, was never yeah, formally pro- announced. The props, website was, was props was, to you and Jeff too. You had them both. Uh, you had them on your list as far as top can- top candidates. Uh, I have to pat myself on the back. That was all me. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I'm not going to take any. No, that was all Drew. 
<laughs> that, that one, one was all me. Uh, but uh, you know, he, you know, the this the story at FAU is weird in the fact it was reported, it was never formally announced, he was never introduced, the website was never changed, and all of a sudden now he's at UCF, who has formally announced him. He's going to be the guy, you know, offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach. He was of the same position at Auburn in 2017 and 2018. He knows UCF. He's seen it up close and personal. Uh, he knows what this program's capable of. And and UCF got a good one. Uh, I really like Chip Lind- the Chip Lindsey hire. Hey, I, I want to I want to talk a little bit more about this because um, you know we, we Lindsey's um, history. Obviously, we talked about the relationship that he had with that he's had with Gus Malzahn. Kind of a similar sort of uh, career path too. Spent a good four or five. Spent a good four years. Started his coaching career at the high school level in Alabama. Um, coached one year as the quarterback coach at Troy. Then he went back to the high school level. Then he went to Auburn in 2013 as an offensive assistant. Um, Southern Miss for a couple years. Arizona State for a year, and then back to Auburn to work with Gus in 2017 and 18. I want to look at this because, you know, it, 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 he only had a 15 and 19 career record as a college head coach in his three years at Troy. He went five and seven, five and six, five and six. But uh, I'm trying to pull up Auburn's numbers from those uh, from those years that he was there, 17 and 18. Um, it, 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 the, the guy, I think, I really understand. And he's going to be the co-offensive coordinator. Is that right? As and yeah, quarterback coach? Oh, he's going to be the offensive coordinator. Well, he's getting the, the, the – there's no co in his title, but the, but Tim Harris is still a co-offensive coordinator. I think that's a way of just putting in a pecking order and, and a way of, of increasing the salary. Uh, his annual salary is uh, yeah, 450000 with available bonuses based on if they uh, go to a bowl game and then more uh, an extra bump if they win the conference. So uh, – when you, when you look at it that way, I, I think it's more just a title thing. We know Gus is going to be calling the plays. He's pretty much said it, and, he, and he's not really tipped it that he's going to change it at all. But I want, I want to hit a couple of things real quick on, on, on the teams. You know, he played – he coached in, in Arizona State in 2016. Coach was – you know, coach was gone after the year, so that's why he moved. And then same thing when he left to go to LSU after his two years at Auburn – Less uh, less miles gets fired at the end of the year, and and he gets to move on and, and become uh, a head coach at, at Troy. But you know, don't it wasn't him who was getting fired as those offensive co- as the offensive the assistant guy coach. who he was working with, right? And right, obviously, yeah. you uh, more almost always you clean house, and that that he, especially in Arizona That's State the business, he was yeah. kind of wrong place at the wrong time. But, you know, as, as I wrote up on, on the Black and Gold Banner website about this, he puts up numbers. Uh, you know, <laughs> Arizona State opened five and one before dropping six straight. And in three of those six losses, they still scored 30 points. You know, yeah. that's not on the offense. You know, the, the, the defense is, it became a sieve. Seven, uh, 17 Auburn, the team that lost to UCF in the Peach Bowl, uh, was – 13th in the country in team passing efficiency, 27th in scoring 34 points a game, 26th in total offense at 451 a game, 26th in rushing at 218.3. And in each of their victory, they won, that team won 10 games. Eight of them, they scored 40 or more. Yeah. yeah so I, that gives you an yeah, idea. That's the in 2017. Ball. Yeah. Outside the Iron Bowl. They 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 scored forty points. Um, that and, you know, if they won the game, they're scoring points. It was when when they couldn't get up to oh you know, you know couldn't get the points on the boards because they're playing against a really good defense. Uh, you know that obviously that's when they lost. But I mean, you know, they still scored twenty seven points against UCF. That that's something to scoff at. You know, yeah, like uh, against, especially against that defense. Now the following year, their defense was actually pretty good, but they did have some trouble scoring points though. I think later on in the year. And I think that was more of a personnel problem. You know, you lost yeah. carry on Johnson. He was your offense. Uh, and I, I think that was kind of when the, the, the writing was on the wall that uh, things just weren't working right at, at Auburn anymore. Um, part of the, part of the problem is that was, you know, the start, the rise of LSU. 
and there's only so much room yeah. at the top. So, I mean, they still had what eight wins that year. Yeah, LSU, um, which, they lost that. They lost to LSU in the third game of the of the season by one point, twenty two. Yeah, and LSU ended up in the Fiesta Bowl against UCF, and we saw where their trajectory went. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had a really good year. I was a really good team. Uh, so I mean, I mean, obviously wins and losses, and on on the surface, all you see is a number. But let's be honest, that was a really good team that they lost against. Uh, but I mean, you play to win the game. So right. I, I don't, I don't really uh ding too much because i everywhere else he's been there there's been results you know positive results and so i i think more so than some of the other candidates that were were out there i i think he's a natural fit he knows the offense he knows gus melzahn's philosophy he's been with him three different seasons you know 17 18 and then and previously in 13 as the uh, as as a young uh, assistant so i he understands and, and I think that's going to be really important in, you know, in development, you know, he helped develop, uh, work with uh, Jarrett Stidham uh, who ended up, you know, ended up in the NFL as a, as a backup quarterback, you know, just getting to the NFL that that's not easy, you know, carry on Johnson, you know, and, uh, you know, playing the NFL, obviously injuries have kind of derailed him, but, you know, they still are producing, you know, uh, yeah, Anthony Schwartz is, you know, a receiver in, in the NFL right now. You know, he's an Auburn guy. Uh, you know, these guys all learned under him. And yet while he's quarterback's coach, he's still going to be working with the offense as a whole as part of his coordinator duty. So, I mean, this all matters. The fact that he's, he's had head coaching experience, that matters because he understands it. Yeah. Uh, was he great at? No, his results were terrible. But you know what? Part of being an offensive coach, uh, a, a head coach, is that defensive side not his wheelhouse? He gets focused yeah. on the offense, which is, and I, I think that'll be really good. I think that head coaching experience is going to go a long way to helping him be even better as an assistant. What does it What does it mean for the quarterback room now? Castellanos coming in. You got uh, uh, now Andrew Brito just announced that he's actually going to be leaving, um, but you know you've got um, Castellanos coming in, like we said, Keen. Um, Gatewood's back, I think. Is that right? Uh, as far as I know, Gatewood's back, and and Navarro is still and around. Parker so I mean, still going to be coming. You have a four quarterback room. I think, I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, so so what so I what do you blame think Brito for? Me. So what do you what do you think that Lindsay's going to do for for that group? Well, I think I think part of it is it, it's a it's a hard reset. You know, obviously, you know, it it'll, it resets the playing field and allows and really allow. I think this actually favors Cassianos the most because the preconceived notion of, of this being Keane's team, uh, I think dies a little bit, you know, yeah, Malzahn's still here and, and he worked with, with Gus and, and, you know, Mikey's worked with Gus, but as far as from the quarterback room, you got a blank slate, you got, you got a fresh start. And I, I think that helps the new guy the most because there's no pre the, the bias is, isn't there, you know, Oh, you, you've been here longer. You better. No, at this point, it's going to be an open quarterback competition. And, you know, they're going to play the best guy. You know, I preferably would like to see a situation where, where Tommy doesn't have to play more than redshirt requirement for next year. But if he's the best guy, you march out the best guy. Eric, what are your big questions now as we head into the new year? We're going to have another. Gus said he wants to get 10 more guys in the in the uh, spring recruit uh, in the spring siding session. Um, We still don't know what the quarterback room is quite going to look like heading into 2022. Um, There's, you know, obviously the transfer portal is over there looming, you know, who knows what's going to happen with that. So what are your big questions that you want that you're looking to see answers to in the next, uh, in the coming weeks and months as we head towards spring practice? Well, I think it's the comings and goings. I mean, we're about to enter the college football free agency portion of the sport now where, you know, you got the transfer portal, you know, as we record this, don't be surprised if you see some, you know, players for UCF that might surprise you that enter the portal uh, because that's just life the way it is. It's free agency. So who who leaves and then how do you, who replaces those players? You mentioned the quarterback. I think the thing I would add to the quarterback room, I think they're going to add a quarterback in the portal. Uh, not necessarily. Had, you know, there, there were some names that were out there that chose not right. to come here. 
Correct. But now you got a new Lindsay factor here. You know, does he have some names in mind that he might be interested in? Does that draw some other names? You know, this thing could evolve. I think they're going to add another quarterback room. I, I Another quarterback. I think they're a little thin. Uh, I think they want to have some more re- experience there. You can never have enough depth. So I think they're going to add that. That's the biggest thing I'm looking for. And I, obviously, who returns and who doesn't. Are they really thin in the quarterback yes, room? Yes, I do. I do because I don't we agree. We just mentioned I, four guys. Well, that's what we think they are. But are we sure that Joey Gatewood is in the long term going to be a quarterback? Is Parker Navarro in the long term going to be a quarterback? Plus, with the transfer portal, though, what happens if those guys decide, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to ditch after the spring because I know I'm not going to play. Well, then you, you still have you still have Cassianos coming in, who's your guy supposedly, right? Sure. And you have Mikey Keene, who started nine games this year. And then what happens if Mikey Keene gets hurt? Then you go with your freshman, right? And who's your backup? I mean, we've already seen that happen before. Right. Well, once. But what happens if you I, have I just you... don't agree with the assessment that the room is thin. Now, if, think... you say, if you're saying it's inexperienced, that's a different question. No, I think it's thin. And we remember now, we're in a COVID world now. You need as many bodies as you can get. Uh, look what happened. This you know, you, You're know, you one injury away and then one test away from all of a sudden playing a fourth-string quarterback. I, I think you do need an extra quarterback, preferably somebody that has experience that's played, just because you know they it's an easier transition for them. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're going to start, that there'd be a guarantee to start, but I, I would be surprised if they didn't add a, a quarterback into this by by the time we get to August. Okay, so, still, so go ahead, Drew. I'm sorry. Of, uh, I was gonna say there's still a lot of talented guys available in the transfer portal. Uh, I mean, Eric's not wrong. You know, they had five quarterbacks in 2021. You know, a fifth guy isn't a bad thing. Plus, I'm actually in the camp that Joey Gatewood should be a tight end um, just because he's such a physical presence. But, I mean, he's not a a quarterback. He's an athlete. Uh, but, I mean, you could still have him as, as, a, as kind of a guy who can, you know, shift over if need be. A fifth guy isn't I, a I terrible thing. I'd make him a thing. running back anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not a terrible thing, but I wouldn't call the room thin. I just think, you know, uh, to, to, to Jeff's defense, I wouldn't call it thin, but having more depth isn't a bad thing either. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, you need that really at all positions, right? What are some of the other positions, I think, Drew, that you need, that, that UCF needs a little bit more depth in? I think, you know, we could use a little bit more help at running back, I think, um, especially when it comes to size. It's still got a lot of smaller guys out there. Um, and, you know, quite possibly on the defensive side, I think that what are the spots that you think need to be shored up a little bit here? Well, um, the, I would say the offensive defensive line are the two position, uh, two areas in particular, uh, both are very senior laden. And, uh, as we know, Kalia Davis has announced he's, he's foregoing his last year of eligibility, moving on to yep. the NFL, uh, the, the defensive line, you know, you know, they had guy a transfer come in and Ricky Barber who, who did a lot. Uh, Big Cat Bryant did a lot, uh, but defensive end was an area where the team was really thin. Uh, you know, Anthony Montalvo, a defensive lineman, had to shift over out of position for a good chunk of the year. You know, and, and give him a lot of credit. He 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 did his, the best he could, but I mean, you could tell he was this was not his position. He's not built for it. He didn't have the speed, the lateral speed, to handle the outside containment, and it caused a lot of problems, especially against Louisville. You know, uh, you know you. You know, you have a very talented defensive end and, and Traymond Morris Brash, who, who, who lined up uh, opposite of, of Big Cat a lot. But I, other than that, it gets really quiet. You know, the the tackles are pretty good. I mean, you've got some talented guys, but I mean, the, the ends are just – it was thin before, and it's even worse now. So you, you, the defensive yeah. end's really big thing. Now, the offensive line – uh, also, you have multiple uh, seniors who, who who are moving on. You have, you know Cole Schneider, who's going to be at the Hula Bowl at, at the Bounce House next month. Uh, you know, senior with Marcus Tatum. You have Sam Jackson. You know, those are three starters right there that are gone. You have to replace them, and and you, and you got to build build up. I mean, as you know, it's natural for those two position groups to have a larger rotation than any other position group. Just the nature of the job, they tire faster. It's the physical demand on that on, on the line on both sides is, is absolutely you know, incredible. So you you rotate a lot. So you need to have that depth naturally to begin with, just for your your normal two deep. Not even accounting for possible injuries. 
So both need, they both need work and, and need to be a focus. All right. Well, we got our marching orders for the spring, Andrew Glucklava. By the way, I, I didn't get this number in, um, but I wanted to give props to your old, your old friend, Andrea Adelson, uh, Eric Lopez, who came yeah. up with the, the best uh, statistic that I saw from the bowl game. And I want to leave, leave this uh, segment on this, uh, on this note. UCF is the first team from the state of Florida, other than Florida State or Miami, to beat the Florida Gators since 1938. And to put that into perspective, who was that team? It was the Stetson Hatters in the 1938 season opener. Um, the Citri- in that year, okay, Florida State was still an all-women's school and would be so for another 10 years and would not actually start, not actually play football against Florida for another 20 years. That year was also the very first year that Miami and Florida actually played a football game. Uh, the Citrus Bowl was two years old. Pine Castle Field, which would later become Orlando International Airport, was still five years away from existence. And my personal favorite, 1938, that was the year that Disney released its very first ever feature film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So. Well, and they didn't have 3.2 million people watching at home, uh, watching the game. Like No, in fact, I don't, I don't even know if they, well, they obviously didn't have television at that time. No. So, <laughs> so so there was that. But That's good. Wow, Stetson, 1938, the last team not called Florida State or Miami to beat Florida from the state of Florida. I want to throw more, a little bit more on there. You know what the capacity of Florida Field was at that time? 22,000. I was going <laughs> to guess about 20,000. 22,000. You know, this was very much a different day. I Their wins against Swanee, who was a, a member of the... The uh, University of the South. Yep. Uh, you know, Tampa, you know, they, 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 they won at, you know, away at T- University of Tampa. Uh, How about Maryland. that for a home and home, huh? <laughs> yeah, Maryland. Um, oh, let's see, Auburn. They had a look, and then they, they tied, lost. They, Go ahead, I'm sorry. They they tied Georgia Tech at zero. Yeah, scoreless <laughs> tie against Georgia, and they and, lost uh, to Temple. Yep, Florida lost that year to Georgia, Boston College, Miami, Mississippi State, and Temple, <laughs> and Stetson, <laughs> and Stetson. Um, rough year, huh? That get you fired. <laughs> Losing to Temple and Stetson in the same year. If you're a Florida, if you're a Florida head coach, that's 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 the hot seat right there. Um, Andrew Glukov, Stat Boy Drew on Twitter. Drew, thanks for joining us. Um, Happy New Year as we head toward the uh, the uh, the the home stretch of bowl season this year. Are uh, are you covering anything uh, outside of that as we head into next week? No, nah, no. Nah. Uh, no one bothered me this year, so I, I'm not covering <laughs> anything else. Not doing any mercenary work this year. Uh, no free Cheez-Its? No, no free Cheez-Its uh, for me. No, no, I, I do have to admit, I hoarded so many Chick-fil-A sandwiches up in Atlanta. I used that to feed <laughs> my brother because that's where I was staying. Hey, did you see the the uh, hardware for the Cheez-It Bowl, by the way? I love I have this. not, but I'm, I, I think part of it is because I'm naturally horrified and what I read about the Duke's Mayo Bowl in the where the winner gets mayonnaise poured on them. No, I mean, okay, let's let's put that aside. Uh, so, <laughs> so first of all, the 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 trophy for the Cheez It Bowl in Orlando is a giant bowl of Cheez Its. Okay, which it should be. I want the pepper. That's jack. why Kyle Nash is not with us on this show because right. he's actually covering that game. giant I want bowl of Cheez Its. Give me the pepper I want jack the extra it. toasty ones. Extra toasty ones are the best. And then you see the MVP trophy. It's not a trophy. It's a it's a championship belt. Those okay, guys get cool. it. That's those cool. guys get it. I love it. <laughs> Every MVP award should be a belt, and you just get to wear that around wherever you want. I, I if I was the MVP of the Cheese It Bowl and I got that belt, I would wear that thing every day. I mean, the Gasparol with the treasure box. Okay, that. That's a, at least at least it's consistent with I'm the cool theme with of the game. I mean, you're playing in a stadium with a pirate ship, crying out loud. But give me the belt. I want the belt. Throw in, throw in the belt. Give them yeah. both. All right. When we come back, 
Let's talk a little hoops. Uh, UCF against Michigan Thursday night. Big game for UCF men's basketball. Taylor Young, radio analyst for UCF men's basketball, joins us to preview the game and talk about the night's 8-2 and two start when we return. This is the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Back after this. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to Cars.com. It's magical. All right, welcome back to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez with you here. Time to talk a little basketball. UCF men's hoops uh, finishing up their non-conference schedule Thursday against the Michigan Wolverines. This is the game we've been looking forward to for quite some time. 7 p.m. on Thursday, ESPN2. Uh, Knights are coming in at 8-2. and two. Michigan comes in 7-4, and four, a little bit of a disappointing start to the season for the uh, for Juwan Howard and the Wolverines and joining us now the radio analyst for UCF basketball number 12 in your programs number one in your hearts as always Taylor Young joining us here to talk about this uh talk about this huge game against Michigan and what UCF is going to uh need going forward as we head into conference play T.Y. what's up man congrats on getting into the new house by the way yeah I appreciate it man like like I said love moving never doing it again and uh (laughs) But hey, we're in before the new year. Super happy about it, and uh, yeah, what a what a huge opportunity tomorrow for uh, for the Knights. Pretty exciting. All right, so let's talk about this one right now because uh, you know Michigan. You know we had the, we always had this game circled, right? But Michigan off to a little bit of a rough start this year, rougher than we thought. They were top five preseason, but you know they lost to Seton Hall, they lost at North Carolina, they lost to Minnesota in their in that conference preview, and they lost. I mean. Lost to Arizona by 18 points, but um, you know these are some pretty good teams that they lost to. But I think that Juwan is probably thinking that they should have had at least a couple of those games. What's your read right now on you know where Michigan is coming into this game against the Knights? Yeah, I, th- I think they're still trying to figure out kind of who they are. I mean, it's a very complete basketball team. When you look at them from top to, bar- to bottom, they have they have they have guard play. They have a, an elite big man. Um, they have really good defenders. And you know, selfishly, when you get a game like that on the calendar, um, you want that team to do really well. I mean, I would have loved to see that Michigan team, who was top five in the country for about five minutes to have remained that way and, and come in undefeated or maybe with one loss. So, um, you know, I'm a little bit bummed about that just because naturally the, the buzz around the game sometimes is uh, a little bit different when you, you have a top 10, top, top five team in the country come play in your arena. But I, I still think that buzz is significant uh, around town. And, uh, you know, I think both teams are uh, clearly talented, right? Preseason type favorites in their conferences is in the upper echelon of their conferences, um, a lot of depth um, and a lot of talent. And, but I think both teams are still kind of figuring out their lineups, figuring out who they are. And, and uh, hey, college basketball, sometimes you drop some. How big is this for, for UCF right now? Because we lost the Florida State game because of Florida State's COVID problems. Um, yeah, and this is the last non-conference game before we head into, into playing the Americans. So this is the last opportunity to really make some noise in terms of that net ranking and, and get some of that, get some of that cross region action. So um, that's what we were thinking initially when, yeah, when that Florida state game went by the boards, like this game just got bigger, didn't it? It did. It's, it's massive. I mean, right. You think about building a resume and you, you know, you're always building a resume you're thinking at large bid. And I think certainly what we figured out about this UCF team is that they're, they're talented enough. They're good enough to uh, get an at-large bid and make a run in March. I mean, that's just a fact. And I think Coach Dawkins and his staff feels that same way. I think sometimes you just have teams that are special and they overachieve. And sometimes you have teams that say, hey, this team's good and this is a team that can do it. And you really just can't waste opportunities in the non-conference. I mean, certainly the American gives you some games that when you win them, if you win them, uh, matter. 
But I, I think the rest of the country, I think the committee looks at name brands. What did you do in the non-conference? And right now, UCF, unfortunately, um, hasn't done enough to really garner that kind of staple win, right? You look at the Auburn game, tough. On the road, Auburn, very good basketball team, but they don't get that one. Um, you, you got Oklahoma that comes in. They play well enough to win, uh, thinking you get that one, but they ended up losing that one. And then the Florida State game, uh, gets canceled because of, you know, everything, of course, out of your control. So I think if you're the coaching staff and you're this team, you say, hey, this is just another game. we got to take care of business. But I think it's a huge game as far as a national perspective. What uh, Put this game in perspective from a program standpoint. You've been with the program now. You were a, d- a decade now going in as an analyst. You were played at the program. This game is basically a sellout. You know, and Coach Dawkins even said this during media day that he wants to attract marquee games to bring the casual fans in, in central Florida. Obviously it's a, we're in an NBA market, you know, the magic basketball. So there's competition from a basketball entertainment standpoint. Uh, I've said, this is maybe the biggest non-conference home game UCF's ever had because of the brand that Michigan brings and the talent they bring, the, the, the notoriety. I mean, this is every, you don't have to be a college basketball fan to know about Michigan basketball. Where do you rank that from this perspective as somebody who's played in it, has broadcasted it with the program, put in context what this means for the program. Because I think there's going to be a lot of people on Thursday that will watch UCF basketball that maybe haven't watched them this season or haven't watched them in general. Yeah, I I think about, you know, the brands that UCF's got the opportunity to take shots at in the past. You talk about the UConns, you talk about Ole Miss coming down. I mean, Nevada was a big game at the time. Um you know, these non-conference opponents, I would agree with you. I think even, even with the, the losses that, that Michigan's had, um, I still think the brand and the timing of the game has created uh, more buzz than any other non-conference game. Specifically, it's tough over the holidays for a school like UCF that's still t- trying to, you know, build their basketball brand in a town and a state that there's a ton of things to do, right, especially over the holidays. Um, I think a team like Michigan coming to town, people pay attention and there's been more people reach out to me um, just saying, hey, we're coming to the game or, hey, can you get tickets or whatever it may be uh, than just about any other game in December that I can remember. And then, of course, you think about the in-conference games, you know, some of those huge games when Calipari and and Memphis uh, teams would roll into town and they're, you know, top five, top ten in the country. But those are in conference, uh, but they didn't feel like in conference games. They felt uh, quite different. So um, that's where my mind goes. You think about the national championship and the, the, the college football playoff. And a lot of those Michigan fans are coming down uh, to Miami, right? So I, yeah. I know uh, a few people that are going to hit the basketball game and they're going to travel down to Miami. So I expect a lot of Michigan fans to show out. So I'm hoping Orlando and, and Night Nation do the same. What's been really working for this team right now through these first 10 games? Eight and two, right? They had the one, obviously, the two losses to Auburn and Oklahoma. The Oklahoma game came down to the last possession. But, you know, to me, you know, from an amateur eye, right, they, it, they, this team doesn't have only one formula that they need to work in order to win, right? They can win a defensive struggle as they have. Uh, you know, they can hold you down. Like, they, they, they held Temple under 50, Uh, They held Bethune-Cookman under 50. They held Jacksonville to 54. But they also dropped 95 on Miami on the road, right? So um, to me, it's nice being able to see that, you know, they can win in a shootout, high-paced game. They can also slow it down. What about – how do you see it? Like, is this this a more um, versatile team than we've seen in years past? Yeah, a resounding yes. I think what you've noticed is you would you would call it an amateur eye, but I think you've been around uh, to see way more. I think you have a veteran eye. I think that's a, a good perspective. I, I feel well, that's strongly nice of you. <laughs> yeah, I mean it is the holidays, man. So I figured you know a little throw that in. No, but I, I think that that's that's what you look at down the stretch because um, you're not always going to have you know games that you shoot the lights out. Um, and, 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 you know, I think including that, I think that's where the depth comes in. Um, you know, can you win in different ways? You know, different players have stepped up at different times. You know, sometimes Brandon Mahan looks like he's, you know, first team All-American. Sometimes you just don't know what he's going to give you. But then you, you have guys that come in and contribute. Um, 
off the bench. Um, you know, the front line last time out was huge in a matchup where the size advantage was significant. Um, and I felt like Northern Alabama gave UCF a really good run. And if, and if you know, if, if that front line didn't play the way that it played, um, I, I really felt like that could have been a closer game than it was. And so, uh, and then Temple on the road, you know, you have a defensive battle and you don't shoot well in the first half, but you find a way to win. I think that also builds confidence. If you can win in different ways, if shots aren't falling, you, you kind of build that muscle to say, that's all right, we're in this. We just got to continue to defend and grind it out because we'll, if it was always we're in at the end, you know, we'll make enough free throws. That's another thing. This team shoots it really well at the free throw line. And winning close games, um, that has a lot to do with that. And a lot of veterans on the team. And, and another thing I noticed about the last game, you know, sometimes the lineups that they'll play, uh, Isaiah Adams has is, is, is struggled this year offensively so far, and I think he's still trying to find himself. But, man, some of those guys, including him, when they come in defensively, the pressure that they bring, um, the chaos that they create, Ty and Freeman's been a, uh, an incredible add, uh, a guy like that off the bench. I think that really allows them the flexibility, like you said, to determine the matchup, who's hot, who's not, and still give themselves a chance to win. What do you think is the biggest key for this team that you've seen in 10 games that you think either has to improve or, or could be the wild card? And not just for the Michigan game, but for the now the conference season that gets going and once we get to the new year and have success, what's the biggest key for them? A uh, shot selection. Uh, in my mind, in my opinion, this team's got – they're loaded with talent. I mean, they're loaded with shot makers. They're loaded with guys that can create their own shot. You think about Darius Perry. I mean, he's one of the top guys in the country as far as creating his own shot. Um, our good friend, Mike O'Donnell, you know, with access to synergy was giving me all these synergy stats about, you know, this, this player's 21st in the country and, you know, step backs and all this crazy madness and the analytics give you, but he's one of those guys that, you know, he's got the ball in his hands, um, in an isolation, uh, situation, he's, he's very effective. One of the top guys in the country. And, um, you know, so I think with all of those weapons, you, you don't have to settle uh, for bad shots early on in the shot clock. There's one thing I know Coach Dawkins wants to play fast. And, you know, for talented teams, typically the more possessions and the higher pace and the higher tempo, you know, favors the, the more talented team. Um, but they're going to they're gonna have matchups similar to this Michigan game and in conference where, you know, that talent level is either going to be even or, or maybe they'll be at a deficit as far as across the board. Uh, so, again, just making sure that in the half court they really get good looks at the basket. Um, so that's one thing I noticed, specifically like Brandon Mahan. He's a guy that is so good, so talented, but his his level of difficulty on his shots that he takes is is so hard, so tough. Like I would never dream to take some of the shots that he takes and makes on a consistent basis. But if you see the games he's had success this year, um, he'll take shots in rhythm. He'll take shots once it's the ball's gone inside and it's gone back outside or take shots in transition. So I would just say, look, if you have a break, push the tempo, get a good look. But if you don't pull it out, run some good offense um, and get good looks at the basket. Because, you know, one thing you, you realize it's similar to football in a way, if you have a really good running game and you're keeping their defense off the field, you know, if you take good, predictable, solid shots offensively, that allows your transition defense to get back and get set and not give that other team opportunities um, to get out in transition and get something easy. Because the one thing we know about UCF is they can defend and they're willing defenders. And in the half court, they're a real problem, and they will shut teams down. So if they can eliminate, you know, quick shots, long shots, and giving teams to run to the other end, um, I think a possession-by-possession possession situation for them, they'll be successful most times. Who, go ahead, Eric. Well, I was going to ask you, interior, you mentioned the depth. And Bakke coming in with C.J. Walker, even Jamal you know, Reynolds has played pretty well recently. This might be the deepest front court the UCF's ever had that I can remember. Do you think this is the best interior defense they've had since Taco? Yes. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, you think some UCF teams, even back, um, you know, my senior year, uh, Tom Herzog was was a, a rim protector. Um, you know, those a lot of the successful teams that make a run have 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 a rim protector that gives people problems and they can afford to you know, get out in passing lanes, pressure the basketball a little bit more because if they make a mistake and get beat off the dribble, you know, somebody's got to go finish over seven feet or 6'11". Um, and I think uh, some of the guys in the interior, C.J. Walker uh, and Bakke Jong, you know, they they're present problems 
um, like that. And even thinking even further back on the team, uh, I, there was a guy named Tony Davis that you guys remember yep. um, before, before we parted ways with him. Um, this is how much a rim protector can matter, right? Like we were really good that year. I'm trying to think of the year, but I, I want to say we were, I don't know, call it, call it 12 and four or something like that. Lost Tony Davis for the rest of the year. And we ended up losing like seven out of the next nine games. Um, and so he was one of those guys that cleaned up a lot of messes around the basket and you, you really are forced to play differently. So I think the interior for UCF strong and that allows them to kind of fly around defensively and pressure the basketball the, the way they do. I remember that year. I think it was what, 2009, 2010. Was that the year, was that the year we beat Florida? It was, uh, no, it was, uh, I think it was Jermaine's, Jermaine Taylor's senior year. The yeah, year we Jermaine's beat Florida was, uh. Herzog 10 and 11, was, but yeah, Herzog right. was, was, was uh, the rim protector. And that team was so good. That, that team, the way we finished was unfortunate. But, you know, that was a team to beat Florida, beat Miami, beat South Florida. And we're, we're knocking off some, some really good teams before we obviously hit a tough skid. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, but yeah, I, I remember. Yeah, that was big. And, and that's why I think the rim protecting such a big part, Taylor, because we didn't, we quite honestly, we haven't had that since Taco obviously graduated. Uh, and I think that's a big factor, not in this game in Michigan with Dickinson, who killed UCF last year in the meeting in Ann Arbor. And it's going to be a big factor in conference play. And that's why I'm optimistic about conference play is because of the rim protecting and the size and the versatility that this team has that they haven't had, honestly, since the Taco Fall Colin Smith team, obviously, in 19 that made the tournament. Yeah, you think about that front court. Um, that's a, that's a heck of a front court that you just mentioned. But yeah, and and you think about Jamil Reynolds who had a good game last time out, but has kind of in the early on part of the season trying to fit into the lineup. You know, you can kind of read his body language a little bit. He's he's searching for his role within this team, I, I believe. And um, but he had a great contribution offensively. But when you think about a guy named you know Hunter Dickinson coming in. You know, it's not going to be one guy that, that shuts him down. It's it's going to have to be multiple guys thrown at him. There's a risk, you know, when they're going inside as much as they do, foul trouble. So I think the front line will be more a factor this game than just about any game. All right, let me ask you this. If this who's the one guy whose name we haven't said yet that you're like, hey, I'd love to see this dude really break out in this game? You know, I really like um, you know, Darius Johnson. And, uh, you know, he's played well and he's a super highly tatted recruit. He's got a ton of game. He runs the show. He's, he, he I, I told a friend this, I was like, I don't know if I've seen uh, quicker feet as far as the way he's, he's got such a low base. He's got quick feet. He's a willing defender. And so on the ball, he is a real problem. He really doesn't get beat off the yeah. dribble. He looks like one of those guys, if you see him on the playground, it's like, oh, God, I hope he's not guarding me. (laughs) I hope he's not guarding me. Yeah. And I used to hate when guys with that low base would guard you because, you know, the the ball is just never safe and he's got quick hands. So defensively, he's played really well. He's ran the show well enough, but he hasn't been able to kind of knock down those open threes when he gets the opportunity and really get it going offensively. So I would love to see him have a have a game where he can get to the foul line, maybe get eight to 10, 12 points and. Uh, and have more of a breakout uh, offensive performance um, just because I really like his game. Boy, I'd like to see him take it to the hole, too, because like, you know, mm-hmm. you're right. Physically, even at 18 years old, he looks like a fullback. Yeah. You know, it's oh, like, yeah. Oh, man, get out of the way, man. He, he's going to be a problem going down the lane. Uh, last thing I want to talk about before we, uh, before we uh, switch over. So as we start conference play right now, who are the teams that you're looking at as we head into the new year that you're like, okay, this is this is the team, this is who's going to be good, this is who's a little surprising, this is a team that I thought would be good, but they're not quite there yet. What have you seen so far in the American? Yeah, I mean, I think the one that sticks out as far as the obvious one is Memphis, um, as far as, um, you know, a, a, a disappointment. Um, yeah. You know, most people thinking that uh, they're going to be really, really tough. And, of course, that seemingly have, you know, all the talent in the world, um, but but seemingly just can't can't put it together. Um, And uh, so that's an interesting one. I remember we started the season. It was like, well, watch out for Memphis. They're going to be really good. No one's going to touch them this year. Uh, And then all of a sudden, 
Um, you know, they're, they're, they're not, they're not looking too great right now, yeah, but of course six I'm, and four yikes. Ooh. Yeah. And then, you know, I'm sure Penny will have them, you know, playing well enough to, uh, but then you always look at, you know, the Houston's, I think, you know, Wichita state with, with the kind of new, new regime and new coaching staff, a lot of belief in, in, in what they're doing. Um, but I do think that when you look at UCF having an opportunity, this, this could be a, a, a really um, great year, which the way their talent stacks up, but how some of the rest of the conference and somebody, you know, like a Memphis is struggling to find themselves a little bit. Um, but I also, you know, Jeff, to your point earlier about the Memphis game being a big game, you know, if conference, if, if, if people within our conference aren't having, you know, incredible years in their you know, top 10, top 15, top 25 ranks, well, when you get to the end of the year and you say, hey, well, we beat Memphis. Well, Memphis wasn't Memphis or, you know, we beat Houston or whatever it may be. Um, that starts to matter more. So that's something I'm thinking about going into conference for sure. That stuff always well, drives me crazy whenever that happens too. It's like, oh, it, right? Memphis wasn't real because because it's like it's like a moving goalpost. It's like, oh, Memphis yes. wasn't real. Well, like, what you are you? Does that mean they were talented or they weren't? I mean, I'm looking up and down that roster. That's a bunch of good guys out there that just haven't figured out a way to gel yet, right? No, ex- exactly. And it does it does drive you nuts. It's, it's kind of like when people are like talking about how, oh, well, you guys don't play anybody. And you're like, you have no idea how it works. Like, you know that those games are scheduled years in advance and like those contracts and those home and homes, yeah. like you can't just schedule those when, you know, you're not like, hey, we have a really good team this year. So we're going to go get, you know, Michigan or we, you know, whatever. We, we're not going to be very good this year. So we're going to schedule soft. Like it's, there's more that goes into that, especially for a team like UCF that has to kind of work to get some of these games. And I wish more people understood that, especially like you have these power five people that, that say that and it just drives me nuts because they have no idea what uh, it takes for UCF to actually get those games, you know, even in football, like three to five years in advance. So well, last word to Eric, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, no, we're, we're not going to have that problem anymore in a couple of years when we join the big 12, because every night's going to be uh, a, a big row. play. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. But, uh, but I want to ask you, because one of the bigger stories in the conference is Marcus Sasser, one of the best players in the league for Houston, out for the year with an injury. Houston's got some injury issues, maybe a little more vulnerable uh, than we, you know, coming in now with some of the injuries they've had. Do players, are they aware of that when something like that, do they get word of that? Like, oh, wow, he's out for the year. That, you know, do you smell some blood there? Because that could th- make things wide open here in the league. And, you know, Memphis has struggled, but it is worth pointing out they beat Alabama recently plenty of time to turn things around Wes Miller at Cincinnati is doing a nice job quietly there in his first year but the Sasser injury I think is significant in this league yeah Sasser's a stud and you uh you hate to see that and Houston's kind of been the class of the conference um as of late so yeah I definitely think the players pay attention to that I mean look I don't know whether people want to admit it or not but I mean as a player you know like I was mentioned earlier you know when you have a good you know, you know, when you have a good team, you know, when you have a chance and you know what the road looks like and you know what other teams are going to do. And it, I think it all comes back to your belief in, 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 Hey, are we able to make a run? And if that belief is yes, whether that's factor, it's a self-confidence thing, or you feel like the conference sets up nicely for you to finish, you know, in the top two spots, which typically would, would mean you get an at-large bid. Um, you know, I, I, I definitely think they pay attention. I think the coaches do more. But I think that communication channel through the players, especially with all the veterans, you know, make no mistake, if you've been around college basketball, you have one goal, and that's to make the NCAA tournament. Um, it's, it's not to just, you know, do a good job and have a good season and hopefully pad your stat. Those, these guys are coming back, talk about Mahan and Perry, to make an NCAA tournament run. And that's my belief. Um, so I, I do uh, think those factors matter uh, in, in a big way. Taylor Young, UCF men's basketball analyst on uh, on the radio with Mark Daniels. You can hear him for the UCF Michigan game uh, on a 96.9 in the game, the flagship station of UCF uh, sports. Uh, let's see, uh, 7 o'clock tip on Thursday. And uh, T.Y., if the fans have a question for you, where can they reach out to you? Man, I'm, you, you're putting pressure on me, and I feel like I had to get be more <laughs> active on Twitter because I know, you know, you hey, people are. can reach out to you on Instagram. I know That's you're. True. I know it's you're on that, it. right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're yeah, asking it. him like he's not Michael Dono. He's on every minute, man, on social media, so, blowing up exactly, material, right? Man. I, I need. You know what? We need, life I need here, to be. Jeff. 
I need to be T wise like social media, you know. Yeah, for sure. I, for, for we can sure. work. We can work out a deal. You know, a small <laughs> monthly fee here. Um, no, uh, Taylor B Young on Instagram. I love you know engaging on 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 just about anything. But but uh, UCF hoops is is at the top of the list. And you know, I think selfishly for me, you know, you guys ask about the history and the and and all that stuff. You know, when I look back. Uh, yeah, like I've been involved with UCF basketball for 16 years, and I think I've only missed one, maybe two home games in that time, whether it's either as a player and a, and a broadcaster. So this game means a lot to me, selfishly, just for all the players and all the fans, you know, especially like you guys that have been laying bricks in the foundation for so long where it really was done in the dark. It was always like, ah, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And to see, you know, some of these waves of games like this or – you know, the NCAA tournament run for a couple of years ago and the way that things are playing out. I'm just super grateful. I'm super excited. You know, one thing you mentioned, Eric, is the, is the uh, transition to the Big 12. You know, it's just kind of what we do at UCF. We just continually level up, right? We go A-Sun, level up to Conference USA, to the American, uh, and now will be the biggest leveling up of Big 12. But but watch out, right? Because that's that's been essentially our brand and we, we have a, a way about uh, doing that. So um, I'm very excited about it. Well, and I know too, Taylor, we've known each other a long time. I know you've got one of the things you'll be looking forward to that big 12. You, you're going to circle that trip to fog Island. I know you normally don't trip. travel. <laughs> yeah. I have a feeling you're going to like, you're going to raise your hand. Like I volunteer to travel to go to some of those games down the road, pay your own way. You're going to pay yeah. your own way out to yeah. Lawrence to go see that. Yeah. Hey, that's, that's what I do. Right. No, what, what we're going to do is my wife and I, we already talked about, we're going to rent an RV and we're going to go, go up to Manhattan, Kansas, and then we're going to bounce over to Lawrence. And then, you know, I have friends that are in Waco and maybe we'll just make a winter of it. You know, hey, Drew's, up there. Drew's, Drew's up there Drew's too, fair, right? Yeah. Drew's, Drew's still at K-State, right? Yeah. And he has been for quite some time, man. And, uh, and I've never gotten up there, uh, which is, you know, you just, the, the adulting and the busyness of, of kids and everything like that. But that will be one that, uh, especially if he's still there, that uh, I will, will hopefully make that happen but uh yeah it'll be fun we got to get the band together got to get the band back together the whole band the whole crazy band (laughs) it's gonna be awesome taylor young thank you so much for spending time with us i'll see you thursday night man all right thanks guys all right stick around we get back we got some fan questions to answer me and eric answering some fan questions from you on twitter stick around the black and gold banner red podcast is back after this Welcome back to the show. Jeff and Eric wrapping things up with you here. We've got some uh, news and notes to pass along for you. UCF women's basketball, they were supposed to play Princeton on Wednesday, but that got canceled because of COVID. Uh, So no New Jersey road trip, no return trip to the Garden State, unfortunately, for UCF women's basketball. So their next game, conference play starts January 2nd, Sunday noon. That's this Sunday against the Temple Owls, Eric Lopez. And And the journey begins for Coach Abe and company. Yeah, I mean, we just talked to Taylor about the men's side and how it's looking like in the American. From the women's side, I think it's pretty much what we expected. I think it's them in South Florida, the top two teams in the league. Uh, UCF, I think, you know, they got to feel pretty good about overall how things have gone. I know the Iowa game was, you know, they kind of wish they had the third quarter back, but with their full yeah. strength back home. I actually think this layoff is good. Uh, I think it'll be they'll be rested. There might be some rust early against Temple, but defense usually tra- uh, doesn't worry about rust, so... Uh, they want to get off to a good starting conference play because there's going to be a bunch of games in bunches here for them. I know Tulane's coming up. That's always been a tricky game, especially when they go up to New Orleans. So, But I think they're in position. Charlie Cream has them in in the NCAA tournament. I know it's early, so it doesn't matter. Um, but I think that's important. They've put themselves in position with their schedule and the win against Arkansas in particular. I, I, I wouldn't say it doesn't matter. I mean, that non-conference schedule is pretty much in, is in the books now. Right. Yeah. I mean, no. You, you, no more is. And that's pretty much what they use as kind of the calibration for these rankings. Is that is that not irregular non-conference schedule? So now what you do in the conference is kind of like it's kind of already baked in right now. South Florida's the number one team in the American in the net rankings, even though they're nine and four, they're 32nd right now. And UCF yeah. is not far behind them at 36th. Yeah, and that would be good enough to make the tournament. Who I don't know who's number three on that list from the American I'll, from a net record. I think that's the second. big question. By the way, also very important. The American reached this week. 
They will not now call do forfeits. If a game doesn't get played in conference, it's not an automatic forfeit like originally. Like Cincinnati Houston on the men's side this week got scrapped. Ori- originally it was going to be a Houston forfeit. They've reversed that just like many conferences have now talked and gone back on that. Now they're going to try to reschedule games if they can't play it and then probably see what oh, happens. Oh, now they revise the forfeit policy. Well, look, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> the league's – well, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I'm, yeah Thinking you know, back yeah, to last yeah, year, yeah. right? Which is why I, I think the forfeit thing was stupid to begin with. Like, why – if you can't play the game, then it's no big deal. Go by win percentage. Like, why are we rewarding games in general, especially in this time of what we're dealing with? I think it's idiotic. Just – if you make try to reschedule the game, and if you can't make it, then so be it. You just go by win percentage. There's going to be a conference tournament at the end anyway with the automatic bid. By the way, Houston is the number three team out of the American in the net ranking, but they're seventieth. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean this is a two bit. This is a two bid league. UCF, USF, those are the top two teams. Uh, that's going to be the collision. The key is. Does either team trip up against somebody else? And I keep bringing up Tulane, Jeff, because we know UCF had their mm-hmm. fits with Tulane in the past, and I know they're coming, you know. So those are some things to look at. And unfortunately, because of that, you got to be careful. And you don't mm-hmm. want to lose too many conference games because that will play yourself into the bubble. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we'll keep an eye on that for us. That, that, that big game Saturday, that's going to be fun to watch to start that, uh, that conference season against, uh, against the uh, Temple Owls at home, ESPNU. By the way, that game is going to be started up. We got some uh, good TV exposure. By the way, we got the yeah. men's on the deuce with uh, Rich Hollenberg, who you may know as the pregame host of the Tampa Bay Rays on Bally Sports. He'll be calling the game with John Crispin on the men's side. I don't know who's calling the women's side, but again, good exposure for UCF. They're going to be showcased a lot in January uh, on TV and be good. They'll be they're they're the team that's been chosen as the counter programming to the NFL. That's right. That's right. So, and you can't forget about that game at SMU Sunday on ESPNU as well. So that's a nice UCF doubleheader mm-hmm. on the U, like you were saying. So make sure you keep an eye on that. Uh, UCF opening up the conference, the men's basketball team opening up their conference slate uh, in Moody Coliseum against at SMU in Dallas uh, on Sunday. Kendrick Davis is the name to watch there for SMU, the guard. Yep. He's one of the best players in the league. UCF's had fits in Dallas, so... Uh, but you know, we got to, you know, and then obviously you have the hangover, possibly the Michigan and all that. But hey, man, conference is here. That's I mean, hell of a yeah. Um, little volleyball news I wanted to uh, pass along here, but uh, uh, a nice little get for uh, UCF uh, volleyball here. I just had it a second ago. Where did I, where, where did I put it? Oh yeah, here it is. Um, Emily Wilson. Get used to hearing this name. Six foot three outside hitter. She played last year at the University of San Diego, USD, the Toreros. She is transferring in to UC up volleyball. Um, nice thing you can add a six three outside hitter, a little bit of size, also from the also from the West Coast. She was a um, by the way, way back in the day, a club teammate of um of Heidi Bondi, who really came on at the end of the year for last year. So this is a Nice little pickup in the transfer for UCF. I know we've seen some players um, leave via the transfer portal. Uh, for example, uh, Catherine Westlich, who, by the way, graduated from UCF, and she deserves to get a, a, to finish out her career elsewhere as a graduate student. She's going to high point. But getting some players in, now that's, that's fun to see here with uh, Emily Wilson joining UCF as an outside hitter. Yeah, I mean, they're going to see comes and goings in all sports with this transfer portal. Where do you see her fitting in right now, as you know it, on the roster for next season? Well, I think they're trying to, they're trying to, I think she falls in line with that spot that Tolly Marmon had, because Tolly's graduated as well. So you kind of want that that extra size outside hitter in those rotations when McKenna Melville's in the back row. So I think this is the, that's the spot that that Emily Wilson is going to fit, and I think she's going to kind of play along. She's going to play off of Heidi Bondi as well. I think we'll see Heidi Bondi kind of play somewhere on that right side a little bit, a little bit more this year, and then this being McKenna Melville's last season, when McKenna moves on, I think you'll see Heidi move into that spot. Emily might be, and, and they'll find a good spot for Emily too as well. I, I think that this is this isn't a rebuild move. This move, this is a reload move for for Todd Dagenet. So 
Um, this would be this would be a lot of fun. Jenny Maurer, man, working the recruiting trail. Unbelievable. Yeah. What They're a job. Cleaning up there. And uh, by the way, salute McKenna Melville, second team All-American, according to Volleyball Magazine, in their version of the uh, yeah. All-American. Uh, excellent stuff, man. Wow. Um, all right. So this takes us to uh, it's relatively light show in terms of the number of things we can talk about. But uh, let's I, I, I put out the, uh, the bat signal for some uh, for some fan questions here. And I wanted to get uh, some of these in here. And we'll start off with uh, <laughs> we'll start off with our old buddy, uh, Jay Hash, who sent me a question, who sent me a uh, picture of Isaiah Bowser and the final score from the Gasparilla Bowl. Uh, 2917 UCF over Florida. Eric Lopez, is this good? It's not bad. <laughs> it's not bad. Not bad. It's not. It's certainly not bad. You know, we talked a little bit earlier about you know the real significance of it. I, I yeah, I say top ten win for UCF. Oh yeah, I think it's top ten. It's, I mean, we wrote about it on BlackyOBanneray.com. It's one of the ten most watched UCF sporting events, uh, football games ever on television. Oh, that's what. Okay, that's what I forgot to ask you about earlier. TV yeah. numbers. We yeah. haven't gotten the Orlando local numbers. Not yet, at, the, at this but, recording. Yeah. I'm a little surprised this didn't overtake the that the NC State St. Pete Bowl actually outrated this one. Yeah, this is the second highest, most watched uh, St. Pete slash Gasparilla Bowl game in history. NC State rated higher. Now, keep in mind, why is the, that? Well, I think there's a few factors. Uh, the NC State game was the day after Christmas. Was on a Friday night. There was no NFL to go up against. Oh yeah, uh, good point. Plus, this was 2014, and you know this very well. You follow this closely. More people had ESPN back in 2014 than they do now, right? Because of cord cutting. So I think a combination of those things uh, played a role in that situation of why the NC State game rated higher uh, than the Florida, or had more viewers than the Florida game. That doesn't mean one of the things we're waiting on to see is the local numbers. I'm really interested to see how Orlando in particular did. But still, this is a very strong number. I mean, I, it's the highest, it's the, the second most watched bowl game ever in St. Pete. It's the most watched UCF pre-Christmas uh, bowl game. To put it in perspective, two years ago when they played Marshall, they did 1.1 million. I know Drew and I have discussed, well, it was a Monday afternoon, which is not a great time slot. That's fine. But if even if you put UCF Marshall in prime time, that's not going to draw 3 million like a UCF Florida. I do think this is a factor because TV likes those numbers, so when UCF and Florida play in 2024 and beyond, that's going to attract a good TV time slot, and TV execs are like, hey, can you guys continue to play Move <laughs> down the road? We like good that. Point. Good point. Uh, Sports Bliss with Rob and Chris asks us, what's the likelihood the men's basketball team makes the NCAA tournament this year? All right. let's, let's couch this in like percentage odds. Boy, T.Y. At T.Y. earlier, he said that this 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 is an at-large team, and I tend to agree with him. I think it's right now, right now, I would say it's greater than fifty percent. Well, I think that's why this Michigan game is very important. Uh, yeah. they got to put a they got to put a a resume win there. That's what they don't have. They don't have a bad loss. They don't have a a, a monster win. Their best win is Miami, but is Miami probably going to be a bottom? ACC team, the Florida, that's why the Florida State cancellation hurts from a scheduling strength standpoint, from a mm-hmm. potential quality win. If you can get this Michigan game, that's huge. That put that gives you a lot more breathing room when you get into conference play. But ultimately, you're, it's how do they fare in conference? And Taylor, you know, we just talked to Taylor about it. The conference is down. I think it could be more wide open than ever before with the Marcus Sasser news. He's out for the year, as we talked about. Yep. Memphis, which Memphis team here? This feels like the league is probably a two bid league, maybe three. So if to me, if UCF's got to finish probably in the top three, top four at worst in the league to be in the mix to make the NCAA tournament. And again, do you beat Houston? Do you beat a Memphis? Do you avoid losses against teams like South Florida and East Carolina? They're in the 200s. A lot of variables. I think the women's, for example, has more room for error than the men. Because the women have a mark, some marquee wins, USC and Arkansas, that the men don't have unless they get this win against Michigan. I want to look at the the net rankings for the men real quick, just to kind of give everyone a lay of the land here. Houston right now, fourth in the country in the net. Uh, UCF is number two, fiftieth. Yeah, not so that's not a, a big great drop. Number. 
Now, Joe Lenardi has UCF in, but there's a caveat in that, in that he is projecting UCF to win the league. If they win the league, we'll be in. Uh, Because you remember last year, Wichita State got in as one of the last four teams in, and I think a big part of that was they won the regular season title. So if UCF were able to pull that off, I think they would get in as well. So there's there's different ways to get in, but they can't have too many slip-ups either. So... Uh, got to get this first crushed. one at got to get this first one in Dallas. You know, road conference sure. road games in conference are well, Remember they're so 1 and 0. Oh. Technically it's the second game because they beat Temple oh, true, in true. December. Yeah, you're so. right. You're right. But you're right. But like yeah. but you know, you, even so, okay, you got one road game in conference. Now you got another road game in conference coming up against SMU. And SMU's 9 and 3, but that's a kind of a soft 9 and 3. They did beat Vanderbilt at home, but they lost to Mizzou. They lost to Loyola Marymount. They lost to or they lost at Oregon. Not a lot of other marquee wins um, on that slate. You know, if you can get that first conference win to start the new year, and you start off two and zero on the road in conference, yeah, like that's yeah, that, that's that that's playing with a little bit of house money. And it goes without saying, obviously, but with everything that's going on, college basketball, we're seeing this all over the place. We went through this last year, man. Stay healthy. Try, yeah. Hopefully, don't you know. I mean, you just, that's the fingers crossed. Some of this is luck in sports. You know, it's like you just hope that, uh, you know, things go well. Well, he had some bad injury luck last year. Maybe we'll get some good injury luck this year. As John Ross supposed to even out. I agree. As John Rosting, the college basketball insider, always tweets out uh, recently here is, uh, you know, stay positive and test negative. (laughs) That's a good point. Uh, Jason Mayer, my old, my old boss, asks: Are there any UCF fans born after 1990 who recognize that Dante Culpepper is the greatest quarterback in UCF history? It's a good question. Doesn't seem like it that that way. Uh... <laughs> How quickly have we forgotten cover of Madden, folks? Hop on YouTube, search Dante Culpepper, and look at prime Dante when he was in when he was with the Minnesota Vikings, and then imagine what he was doing at the college level. How great he was. I mean, unbelievable. It's, he was a top 10, I think it was seventh high school finalist. Got, someone has got, listen, I we desperately need, okay, memo out to UCF, to UCF football. We got to get like a really good Dante Culpepper highlight reel up on YouTube of his days at UCF. I know those tapes exist. I've seen them with my own two eyes. I've touched them with my own hands. They're in the archive there. We got to go back. We got to get some good Dante... There's not a lot of good Dante highlights on YouTube. We got to get some up there just to show, just to remind people of what what he was. You can also Google his name on BlackAndGoldBenerit.com and read my top uh, 100 male athletes and get a good in-depth piece on yeah. Dante. Why I rate them the number one UCF greatest athlete of all time. Look, obviously, a lot of people are going to be biased towards McKenzie. It's the most recency bias. Uh, and look, McKenzie has a great resume himself to be in the conversation. My counter to that is if I put Dante Culpepper on that 2017 team, an 18 team, not only do they go undefeated, they make the playoff because he's he was that big of a name. He was larger than life. He was John, you know, obviously we have the news this week with John Madden. To me, yeah. he was the John Madden of UCF because he put UCF football on the map. You didn't have to be a UCF fan to want to see Dante Culpepper play. That's how big of a name he was. Yeah. ESPN did it, features on him. He was huge. Did, it was at that time. It wasn't you know people didn't see UCF play. They came to watch Dante Culpepper play. Bingo! I got That's, hooked. Yeah. I only re, one of the reasons I came to you. I didn't hear about UCF until I heard this halftime feature on Dante Culpepper because he played well at Nebraska, yeah. and then then everybody's like, "Hey, this is the best quarterback in the state." In his senior year, I went visited my butt and went to a Halloween Horror Nights. In Universal. Is that still a thing? I don't know. Anyway. Yes, very much so. Anyway, carry on. Back, thank you. So I went my senior year in high school, and I went to see Culpepper play because it was the hoopla. I got to see this guy play at the Citrus Bowl at, against Youngstown State, who was coached by uh, Jim Tressel at the time. Jim Tressel, I, that's right. And I went to see the campus, and about a year or two later, I decided to come to UCF. I don't think I would come to UCF without Dante Culpepper. Corey Esquinazzi asks us if the Knights don't land a transfer quarterback what are the reasonable expectations for Mikey Keene year two in Gus's offense well I think you hope he gets more you know he kind of gets more experience uh maybe a little bit more accuracy throws it's just more to be more comfortable hopefully he's got you'll have more healthier weapons around him 
so I think it's a lot of variables. Who's going to be in the backfield with him? Who's, who's he throwing the ball? How is the offensive line? So I don't think it's just him. But obviously you're hoping he's going to – and you mentioned this on our Night Shift show, which people can check out on our podcast device, uh, feeds here as well as on our YouTube page. What does he do now from now until August will yeah. be the big factor, right? It's not – you know, what, what, what does he do when nobody's paying attention? You know, we saw this with McKenzie. I don't like making that comparison, but it is accurate. McKenzie made leapfrog things, made big jump. From Leaps January, and yeah, yep, and uh, that's, and I actually like the open competition of this situation. He knows he's going to be competing with Castellanos and possibly a quarterback coming in. Maybe not. Either way, I like the fact there's competition because competition will bring out the best of people, and I think the coaching staff likes that too. Yeah, if I, if I'm Mikey, I, I think I said this on Night Shift. If I'm Mikey, you know, I'm I'm camping in the film room. Right, and I'm I, I'm working constantly with my receivers uh, over the spring, and I'm that first guy in, last guy out. Anytime, it, whoever the transfer guy is, or it cast, I don't know if Tommy Castellanos is going to be um, enrolling in the spring, but uh, I don't think he is. But I'm going to be the guy who is constantly there when the coaches are walking in the building with their cup of coffee. They come in the office; they're going to see me looking at tape. Well, and the and, players know and, him and too make, now. Yeah, yeah, and make and literally make that make them make that decision and for and say it, 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 it say, are you sure I'm not the guy? Right, exactly. And here yeah. he's been there. He's battled with the players, and the players respect that. Yeah. And while it hasn't been maybe artistic, quote unquote, he protected the football. He's a game manager, and he has a win against Florida. I do think that matters. Yeah. When you look at the history of UCF quarterbacks, we talked about Cole Pepper. He had so many great memories. I thought I think back to that Nebraska game in '97 that lot the nation you know paid attention. That was a Nebraska team that went on to win the national title. Scott I think Frost, back, yeah, yeah, it was the quarterback at the time. Uh, you think of Ryan Schneider. When you think of Ryan Schneider, you think about the Alabama win. He led them to that game-winning drive to beat Alabama. Mackenzie Milton, obviously, so many games you could pick from the Peach Bowl, etc. Justin Holman. There's the the East Carolina win, the Hale Perriman. Uh, there's memorable moments. He's got one already in his career. That throw to Ryan O'Keefe is a memorable play that will go down in history, and he can say, I was the starting quarterback for UCF when we beat Florida for the first time. Nobody right. else can say that, and that's got to give him some confidence, and I think it gives his pl- the, his teammates confidence in him. So I expect a, a much improved Mikey Keene. How much is the the the, 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 the improvement? That remains to be seen. We don't know what the ceiling is with him yet. We'll maybe get some answers come spring. Best Hour asks kind of a tongue-in-cheek question here. When is UCF adding a swim team? I want to flip this on its head a little bit. All right? Um, here, we, here, we are, here, here we are telling Terry Mahaja what to do with his budget. But what sport would you like to see, sport or sports, would you like to see UCF add one day down the line? I, I know, I, I mean, this... We're playing with unlimited, you know, like here we are spending other people's money, right? Well, but, but it's something that Terry's addressed on social media, obviously with the pending move to the Big 12. He, he, I think he, and I want to paraphrase what he said on social media, that is something that they'll think they're, they've, you know, they've, they've, you know, they've, they've thought about and will could be a possibility down the road. You know, obviously the sport that comes up the most, right? It's men's track. Yeah. That's the yeah. most, the one that comes up the most. Uh to me, that that would make a logical sense. A lot of this too is Title IX also related. What do you need to add? What can you add? Uh, some people brought up swimming, right? Or, or in our chat, swimming here. and diving. Yeah, I don't know how the dynamics of all that works. You would have to build facilities for that, whereas men's track you'd not necessarily yeah. have to. For example, well, it's it's a little, it's a little kind of possibly. I, it, it's. The only real swimming facility that UCF has is in the Rec and Wellness Center, and that's not a. I, I would. There are some programs that have a similar setup in the Big Twelve, but they do all their meets on the road, you know, and that's kind of just their practice facility is in that sort of Rec Center type thing. I forget which ones have that, but um, you know, th- that would be like swimming and diving is a big monetary investment. It takes. It costs a lot of money now. There is a really, really good like swimming and diving club community here in Orlando, around the area, right? And I think that there is a market for having a really good competitive facility that 
who knows if if someone gets creative with the fundraising and the financing of it you know uh west virginia actually just opened up this really beautiful swim facility and they did it it's off campus but they did it in um in conjunction with the with the local ymca and uh, and built this really uh, go take a look at it it's brand new it's beautiful and I think there could be something there there's I think there's an appetite for it here. And we're in Florida, you can compete in the Big 12 right away in swimming and diving. I think that there I think there is an appetite for it, but I think you're right. I think I think that the number one thing that the low-hanging fruit, right? Eric is men's track and field because we have a women's track and field program, track and field and cross country. We don't have a men's one. And that would be a big help I don't know how Gus would feel about this, but I, I think that that would be a big help for the football program. Could potentially. Uh, yeah. You could definitely. I mean, there's been stories of guys that play track. They run track and play football. So, yeah, that's, I feel like that would be the popular answer. Uh, a couple other ones. Give me, that, give me a wild card. Give me a wild card that's kind of like out of the blue. You're like, yeah, it would be cool if we had this. I don't know if it's out of the blue because we've discussed this actually with Todd Dagenet in the past, and that's beach volleyball. Florida yeah. State has beach volleyball. Stetson has beach volleyball. Uh, it's the, the the tournament gets televised on ESPNU now. Why couldn't you see that, for example, in Orlando have a beach volleyball program in the spring? I think, you know, try to develop uh, athletes to go participate in the Olympics because beach volleyball is big in the Olympics. Mm-hmm. That's my other wild card. Again, Todd would know more about that stuff and the, the logistics and all that, but that would be my, my wild card third choice. I think men's track would be everybody's number one. I think swimming, diving could be a little complicated, but could happen. And I think, uh, I would say, I think there could be maybe some nutrition there for beach volleyball. I think that could be an easier, you know, to, where do you build a sand and all that stuff. But I would think that would be the other one. I'm all in on that one. And having covered Georgia for two years, I'll tell you, you know, I, I, I really think that, you know, w- will be a really cool program and actually a, a real revenue winner for UCF would be gymnastics. I, I think it, that, that could Ooh. be a real, that would be a real, now I, I covered the Georgia Gym Dogs for two years. They sold out their meets at Stegman Coliseum. They drew more than the basketball team did. And, 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 and given how, you know, UCF's, prowess in cheerleading which is obviously very gymnastics you know kind of adjacent to gymnastics i think that if ucf developed a gym a gymnastics team that could compete in the big 12 that could be a really good draw too for revenue and to back up your point big 12 does support gymnastics so yep. that is that would not you know it's not like you have to go to a different sport or you know what i mean uh you're right they they endorsed uh it, gymnastics which does pretty well television numbers. In fact, the NCAA championships in gymnastics uh, was on ABC this Huge. past year. Did very good numbers. Huge TV numbers for that. So you're right. That could be a factor. Swimming and diving is also on the Big 12 indoors. They don't have beach volleyball. The, uh, so that could be a negative. Yeah, that might be tricky. Right. Uh, they also endorse wrestling. We actually have a Hall of Famer in the UCF Hall of Famer. There was a wrestler at once upon a time at UCF and Johnny Rouse. So... Uh, hey, Cal, I, let's, let's get Cal Bloom and uh, Parker Boudreau uh, out there here. There we go. Yeah, see hey, that. did you see, you see uh, NXT pushing uh, pushing Harlan, right? Pushing yeah. Parker Boudreau a little bit this week. Him, him and Cal Bloom, who's going under the name Von Wagner. We got two uh, WWE guys, uh, future guys here with UCF. We got, Absolutely. We got guys with gimmicks now. Yep. They, I, don't, I don't think either one of them were NCAA wrestlers, but that's correct. They both no, they have weren't. gimmicks. We'll see how that goes. We'll see if they get called up well, to the big roster soon down there. Maybe well, Cal, well, Cal's got uh, – Cal, Cal, that runs in his family because his dad was a pro wrestler. Yes, right? and so, I think his dad is working dad. behind the scenes over there too from what I've read. Right. Yeah, I don't know if Parker had any um, any connection to the industry prior to just like going all in on it. I'm not 100% sure. No, basically, it's, I look like Brock Lesnar, and a lot of people took notice. That's really what, how he – no, seriously, that's what happened. Like Paul Heyman and Jim Ross and these big-name wrestling promoters and people that know to evaluate talents, like, that's the next big star. And, you know, the WWE has kind of gone very extreme here recently where they're trying to recruit football players. In fact, they, had, they just announced their name, image, likeness. They are now promoting college athletes – and I think part of the reason is they want to see, hey, we'll, we'll help you during college, and then after you're done with college, maybe you uh, try to join the WWE. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow, that's an interesting time right now. All right, so 
Michigan Thursday, conference opener Sunday. We got a, you know, it's kind of like the spring sports aren't starting yet, but we're diving headfirst into basketball. So I will be there uh, for the Michigan game. Eric, what are you going to be up to? I'll be tuning into the game, uh, listening to Taylor and Mark, as well as watching on TV. The game will be on ESPN2, by the way. ESPN2 could be a big audience for UCF basketball against Michigan opposite the Peach Bowl, which nobody cares about. I mean, nobody, not even Michigan State <laughs> and uh, Pittsburgh give a crap. Uh, Rich Hollenberg and John Crisp will be doing game. We'll be doing a post-game show. Night Shift will be on after the Michigan game, a special edition to recap the Michigan game and the year in UCF 21. Hopefully we're uh, recapping a victory. But uh, like I said, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube page as well as our podcast feed because we got a lot of content. That's not going to slow down in 2022. Thanks to everybody, by the way, that's tuned in to our post game of the Gasparilla Bowl. Uh, yeah. Monster numbers on both sides and a lot of feedback and appreciate that. And, from uh, everybody. and it was in the podcast feed too. I want to yeah. appreciate everyone listening to that. Uh, the uh, Okay, so a couple of things people we want to thank. First of all, huge thanks as always to Taylor Young. Thanks, thanks again to him for joining us and giving us some input and some insight from UCF men's basketball. Follow him on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, thanks again to Drew, uh, Andrew Glukoff, for joining us in the first segment. Stat Boy Drew on Twitter. Thanks, as always, to Kyle Nash, who's just been killing it for us, covering basketball, the SOTG. He's the guy you want to follow for the basketball coverage throughout the week. Uh, and also make sure you follow It's Bryson Turner for some of the latest uh, news and notes from going on around UCF. It's Bryson Turner on Twitter. You can follow Eric at Eric Lopez Elo. Follow me at Jeff underscore Sharon. You can follow all of us collectively at UCF Banneret underscore SBN. And once again, this is the point where I must emphasize, if you followed us at our old, old handle, you're probably not following us on the new handle, UCF Banneret underscore SBN. Make sure you follow us there, as well as Facebook.com slash Black and Gold Banneret and it's Black and Gold Banneret.com, where we are your home for UCF sports on SB Nation. All right, Elo, enjoy it. I'll, see, I'll talk to you Thursday night. Sounds good, man. Enjoy it uh, and have a good broadcast, buddy. All right, sounds good to me there, and uh, that'll do it for us here on the Black Hail to the Banner Knights! Advice. Yes! Gosh, it's always good to go into a new year. Don't tell me that these bowl games don't matter, Eric Lopez, because I'm feeling great heading into 2022 after this bowl game. For Eric Lopez, I'm Jeff Sharon saying thanks for listening. This has been the Black Knight Banner Podcast. Enjoy the weekend. We will see you Thursday for UCF and Michigan. Take care.